fellow men, women and children, illumination, navigation, and celebration! Lab lighters, light the city! One of our pet peeves, someone's like, hey, why don't you guys use LEDs? Our lamp lighting the playa is, is our art project. It's our contribution to Burning Man. We like that we use kerosene and we like that we don't use LEDs. And we get that with all the LEDs on the playa, it's a little bit harder to see the lamps and they don't provide as much illumination uh, as they used to. They're a little more celebration and a little less illumination. You know, it's our ritual and it's our, it's our art project. And fuck you, we're not using LEDs. Why don't you go tell Death Guild how to run the Thunderdome? Good, you should do that. I won't. <laughs> I like, don't think that like, that's safe. <laughs> Pro tip, though, these things take kerosene. Once somebody put white gas in there, and it's it's basically turns your, your nice kerosene lantern into a Molotov cocktail. Ooh. I wonder what would happen if you put nitromethane in it. I wonder what nitromethane is. It's a uh, model airplane fuel. Ooh. Burns real nice. Oh, it's the good stuff. Yeah. I mean, you can huff that for <laughs> minutes. Minutes. Fully minutes before <laughs> suffocating. Hi, friends. This is Beth. Uh, today, we are going to be talking to Moonbeam, who I met on Playa this year. So, um, Moonbeam is legitimately my real name. He was out with a bunch of lamplighters. It was nice to finally chat with one, because, I mean, to be honest, it is... It's definitely one of the things that we've made fun of. Sorry, lamplighters. My parents were hippies, as you might as you might guess. So, so you don't have a playa name. No, and sad. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a delight to talk to, and his perspective on the tradition was kind of great and neat and super charming. So I asked him to come into the studio and talk to us for a while. So uh, my middle name. Uh, is Moonbeam. I actually, a few years ago, I was like, hey, can I can I have like a real playa name? I'm kind of sick of just being called like Moonbeam. I know it's funny that it's my real name and everything, but I feel like I could I could use a different playa name. Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Call me Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but before we get into it with Moonbeam, let's take a moment and really enjoy how difficult it is for D-Day and Rex to describe a lantern. So, Rex... Today in the studio, we have got a, for lack of a better term, a tube of blue and silver goodness just sitting here right in front of us. Yeah, you could you could call that a tube or uh, a, a stacked cylindrical object. It's like a tube between two watts, if I had to describe it precisely. That's very poetic. And what you're describing is a, a lantern. A Dietz number 20 lantern. Of which, the lamp ladders department at Burning Man is the second largest purchaser of these lanterns in the entire world. The first largest is, of course, the Disney Corporation, which uses them not as kerosene lanterns. They take the mechanism out, they pop an LED in there, and I assume they use it to light their sweatshops in feudal Disneyland. Now, back to Burning Man. So the guy who brought me to Burning Man my first time, um, or talked to me into going my first time, was my high school mentor. Uh -huh. So my, my high school had this mentoring program when they had kids who were like a little bit challenged. They would line you up with someone from the community to kind of like coach you and teach you about things that you were interested in. And I was, I was the lone computer geek hanging out in the lab playing by myself. And he um, founded a successful tech company back in the 70s and had retired to Aspen, Colorado, where I grew up. They had recruited him to be a, a mentor, and so I spent all my high school years hanging out with him and building computer stuff and doing cool things. He went to Burning Man for the first time in 2002, uh -huh. and I was just driving back through Aspen, and he had all his pictures, and he's like, I gotta show you all these pictures. I gotta show you all this cool stuff. I just came back from Burn. He had that after Burn, after first Burn glow that people. It was have. even more special back then because we hadn't really proliferated any sort of web presence besides Tribe.com. Tribe.net, yeah. Tribe, yeah. I had heard about Burning Man because I'd been living in the Bay Area, but I hadn't gone. Mm -hmm. He's like, look, I'm I'm doing a camp. I'm doing a theme camp. He had second year itis. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And so I was like, I'm doing a theme camp, and I, I need some friends to come help me out, and I've got all these visions, and he had he had way too many visions. He wanted to build an art car. Uh, oh, an art car your second year. That seems like the funnest thing. Yeah, right? but that's third year shit. <laughs> and then never again in my experience. <laughs> Yeah, he had this vision for this art car. And actually, that art car is still on the playa. The art car is called MAM, and it's a giant, it's a skeleton of a mammoth. Oh, yeah. I know that art car. Yeah. So it's it's currently bicycle powered, but he had this idea that it would be powered by electric motors. And he had like a couple of those Honda quiet generators, and he had these electric motors. Or I saw his plans, and I was working with him on it. And I was like, I've never been to Burning Man, so I understand that I, I don't know what the ground surface is exactly like. But I hear it's a desert, and I'm looking at your design, and you have six-inch wheels. And there's no way this is going to work. Like, this thing is just not going to go anywhere. And he's like, no, no, the ground's really hard. It'll be fine. (laughs) (laughs) So we get out to Burning Man, and this camp was huge. First of all, they gave him Esplanade placement, like his first year as a theme camp. So we were like 7.30. This is what it was like in 2003. Yeah, so like 2003, <laughs> exactly. We were right next to Embassy, which was the renamed or- Oregon Country Fair camp. Uh-huh. He had recruited a bunch of other people he knew to be part of the camp. He built a giant geodesic dome that he had a friend of his design and, and make all the, the parts for. He had this big art car. I mean, it was like, it was such a production, this whole camp. So the art car never went anywhere that year, <laughs> um, except for once. He was setting it up, and he had just plugged it all together, and it started rolling forward, and it actually ran him over. Ooh. <laughs> and a ranger ran up and saw this happening, and basically just yanked all the power cables out of the like thing because like it was it was just, like literally rolling over this guy. So the the ranger just like grabbed wires and pulled them, and so that set back that thing from working for the rest of that year. Ultimately, it probably wouldn't have gone very far anyway because tiny little wheels. Uh He had this vision of like a platform that people would party on and it would be like a mirage because you wouldn't be able to really see what people were standing on until you got close. Mm -hmm. But it would be like kind of cruising across the desert. It would be the skeleton hanging above like the people partying. It would be kind of a mirage. Sounds like there's no room for shocks. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) i was like you know you could do the same design it's just the wheels are going to have to come up like above like you can put the platform suspended from the wheels but the wheels are going to have to be bigger yeah and you still need playa snake clearance yeah it's so easy to high center low things on that playa yeah exactly it 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 maybe needed to be a foot off the ground Uh not like six inches or four (laughs) inches or whatever he really wanted I mean, it, was a, it was a cool idea, but it didn't it didn't work out. And his whole thing, so he had this great story that he would tell. You are what you eat, right? So he had actually eaten mammoth meat. Wow. They that, genetically engineering that now? No, it was... This thought was out of a glacier? Thought out of a glacier. He was a graduate of Harvard. The Harvard Club in New York City often has these very elaborate dinners. This is back in the 60s. Uh-huh. They actually defrosted a mammoth from a glacier, sliced it up, and served three or four ounces of mammoth meat to everyone that had paid $500 or whatever for this dinner at the Harvard Club in New York. So he's like, you know, I ate some mammoth at some point in my life. Clearly, there's some molecules in me that are like still from that mammoth. (laughs) So we had the Piltdown camp, and uh, we were all dressed up in caveman gear, and we had this mammoth art car. That was the camp my first year. So even though you had this like really tits first year camp to fall into... It was a plug-and-play camp. It was like a 2003 plug-and-play camp. Uh I literally showed up. My tent was already set up. I mean, it wasn't an RV or anything, but they had a tent with an air mattress already set up for me. I just, like, crawled into bed, and I was set to go. I've done that as a gift to friends before, but, like, you didn't pay money in exchange for servants, like, serving you drinks and giving you bag lunches to take out to deep playa with you. No, no, no. This was definitely a uh, my friend doing me a doing me a solid. Yeah, by so making you, my you first did a bit of eating. Barbie camping. Yeah, okay. <laughs> call it that. But the thing was, that he's a, he's a great guy. But the rest of the people in the camp, I just didn't cl- click with them. Like they were all interesting people, but I just I don't know. I didn't want to hang out with them. That Thursday of the event, I walked over to center camp, and I had seen the like I had been watching the population total every day by walking to play info, and uh-huh. it was like. Oh my God, there's 14,000 people here. (laughs) It's so big. Is that another thing that they still do? (laughs) I don't know if they still do that. I assume they do. I think they post the daily population numbers on on a a chalkboard at Playa Info. Only ever been there once. 
I don't the even Wednesday think it's or Thursday after the event because I needed a water bottle, and that's when they <laughs> that's when they give away all of their water bottles to whoever wants them, and they have the three saddest tables imaginable of keys, just all of the keys that they found <coughs> on banquet tables set up, and it's just like a banquet of sadness. <laughs> Pro tip: put your camp address on your keychain. Ooh, yeah, that's smart. wow. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, that first year in, on Thursday of the event, I was hanging out and I went to center camp and I saw that you could volunteer for lamplighters. So I went and volunteered and I was like, these are my people. Like I have found my people. And so I, I literally went back to camp after volunteering and loaded on the, like the crappiest Wi-Fi ever that we had in 2003, which was slow and basically useless, but fast enough to load the volunteer page for the org. And I volunteered to light lamps the next year and i started camping with lamp buyers in 2004 and i've camped with them every year since holy shit you had wi-fi in 2003 just we, in general like i don't know if i had that <laughs> back then did we have wi-fi in 2003 we were camping next to oregon country fairs camp and they had a wi-fi access point i think burning man as a like first principle is you get out of it what you put into it uh-huh being at burning man with a bunch of people I didn't know very well and not having anything to do, like specifically responsibilities, kind of sucked. I think it was more that I went to volunteer and I really liked the people I volunteered with, but I also really liked having a purpose. And so going to be a lamplighter meant that I had something to do every night. You know, we go out and we do this art project and I feel like I've contributed to the city and I'm not just there to hang out and party. Yeah, I pretty much had the same experience. As soon as I started volunteering, I started getting more and more out of the event. Yeah, 100%. In 2007, 2008, I was a setup crew manager for Lamplighters. I was out there for a month, and it was amazing. Oh, I'm so jealous. I've always wanted to do more than a couple of weeks. It's worth it, but I had to basically quit my job one of the times. Yeah, I've quit a couple of jobs for Burning Man. I, it, it's got to work out just right that I can quit and I have enough money to survive for that long a time. Or like I'm, I'm ready to quit and move out of my apartment. Right. We are not rich tech fucks from the Bay Area. We are service and nonprofit folk who have almost no money. And yet, because we make Burning Man a priority, we're able to go. Don't believe the shit that you hear on the news. We're not all rich tech fucks. San Francisco is mostly rich tech fucks now. <laughs> but Burning Man, still pretty legit. Yeah, and I find To be fair, I'm, I'm somewhat of a rich tech fuck now. Not rich, but like I do work for a tech company. Uh, that That's like... 60% of the populace of this city. <laughs> yeah, and I am much more interested in conveying my punk rock cred <laughs> than, than mine. You can oh, let cool. Radio Land know whatever you want about you, but <laughs> we're kind of poor. I have a perpetual guilt about making more money than some of my friends. Some of our friends are real scumbags, so I still get that too. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what socioeconomic bracket you're in, like there's someone who's in even more trouble if their car gets fucked. Yeah, that's true. That is absolutely true. Besides, we, we accept stories from all types here, no matter what your level of affluence. <laughs> Do you well, have friends that run plug-and-play camps? Can we interview them? No. I actually don't have any friends who have even been to a plug-and-play camp. I think the people camping next to us this year, I don't think it was exactly a plug-and-play camp, but it was definitely a pretty full-service camp. They were they were on the center camp circle, and they were handing out free bread every day, freshly baked flatbread. Oh, that was the, the Love and Oven? Love and Oven. They yeah. were right next to us. It seemed like they had a little vibe going. I never went in because that... that concept proselytize me yeah there was no proselytizing they were literally just handing just out free bread it was like all week long it was with jam and nutella it was pretty legit well shit i shouldn't let my fear of religion interfere with my desire for fresh baked bread we had to smell the fresh baked bread all the time oh, wow. the worst. <laughs> when you get into those big theme camps they are of such a complex operational bent that you need a lot of structure and you need a lot of people doing things that aren't primary to the mission of the camp. Yeah, no, Lamplighter Camp has has a whole crew of people that just do logistics and never go lamplighting. We have a kitchen crew of 12 or 15 people that just make meals for our camp. Everybody's working, but everybody has to work on different things. Yeah, yeah. I think that's just a, a function of size. Yeah, you Once get 200 you... people in your camp, somebody's got to deal with making sure you have enough stuff for the bar and not everybody brings whiskey. Uh-huh. <laughs> Wait. Why is that a problem? 
I wouldn't have a problem with it, but <laughs> people seem to have a problem with like, what are you serving at your bar? Whiskey. But I want a Diet Coke with vodka. And you're like, well, I don't want to serve you that. <laughs> what I can do is pour some of this whiskey and some of that beer because the bar is so dry, we're using beer for mixers now. Yeah. I never expect to get served anything but what's at that bar when I go to a bar at Burning Man. What I'd really like to know is how the lamplighters camp and the whole setup, ritualized, beautiful thing that the lamplighters do for the community, how did that have the mission drift into you guys becoming a a 21-hour-a-day bar for the community during the event? So, you know, you have a camp of 200 people, and you end up with a few people that are more excited about partying and drinking with their friends who come to Burning Man every year than really about, like, the ritualized lighting of the city. And that's fine, but they just got so excited about that over the years that they got more and more interested in making sure that our bar was good every year. And our bar got better and better. And just like we have a kitchen manager, we have a bar manager, we have someone who manages the lamplighting, and those three are like the same footing in the lamplighter organization. Oh, I like that. The bar just evolved eventually to be this 21-hour-a-day bar. I think the thing is we need a good bar for recruiting, Mm -hmm. And it started with, we used to have the first party of Burning Man. Like, it used to be at Lamplighters. It was on Monday night, 9 o'clock at night, we'd throw this sangria party with quesadillas. And people would come and eat quesadillas and drink sangria in our lounge. And it was a huge pain in the ass because we spent all day on Saturday and Sunday making sangria because it has to, like, you know, marinate to be good sangria. Uh So, you know, we chop a few hundred pounds of fruit and uh, make a couple hundred gallons of sangria and then serve that on Monday night. And we stopped doing that because uh, if you give somebody a cocktail that has fruit in it, they will drink the cocktail and drop the fruit on the ground and they will moop the fuck out of your bar. People huh. are fucking animals. I know, Who right? Who doesn't eat their garnish fruit? Who doesn't? Especially I mean, out, like, there's not going to be fruit far beyond Tuesday. Yeah, like... Perfectly that's, good. I mean, we even cut the peels off. I mean, it was like, come oh, on. Oh, that's some bullshit. Savages. So anyway, so we stopped doing that party. And we also used to do the Bloody Mary party. which And is that a, was Wednesday brunch? That was Wednesday brunch. Oh, man. That was great. Problematic because all the lamplighters would get so drunk that we had trouble actually being functionally sober enough to light lamps on <laughs> Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, vodka in the morning means nothing happens after five. Yeah, that whole day is wasted. So we now do a different party on Wednesday, although there is uh, some agitation to bring the Bloody Mary party back. But it was another pain in the ass thing. So we'd take those sangria buckets, we'd wash them out, and then we'd make 200 gallons of Bloody Mary mix. You guys bring back Bloody Mary anything, and I will work a shift during the event to help that happen. That was a formative event in my early years. That was, that was definitely one of my favorite parties of the week. Those were legit Bloody Marys. I, I, I miss them. So you were going to give us a little bit of the history of the lamp lighters, yeah? Yeah, for sure. We've been lighting lamps on Playa since the first year that there were people on the Playa for Burning Man. Mm-hmm. So uh, we started in 1991, and there was a guy named Steve Mobia, and he brought 12 lanterns. Actually, he brought the not junior version of the lantern out to the Playa. He, he brought 12 of them out there, and he just he made a little pathway between center camp and where the man was standing on his hay bales. He just put the 12 lanterns on the ground, and at the end of the event, all the lanterns got stolen. Or... <laughs> <laughs> got taken as souvenirs. Taken as souvenirs, just like street signs. So Larry Harvey would help him light the lamps every night. This just became the thing. And so he talked to Larry after the event, and they're like, these lamps are cool but we need spires for them so that people don't steal them and they're a little more visible the next year they sat down and they drew out some plans for spires which are still the design that we use for the spires that lead the way to the man all the other stuff just developed over that time i i saw the video that's been going around of the 97 burn when they were on the the other little playa Mm -hmm. the lamplighters are wearing the robes then and they've got the same carry poles that we use now so all of the stuff that we do dates back to at least 97 Lamplighters might be the oldest continuous department. It was a couple of years before Rangers popped up. Yeah, we think we're the oldest, at least continuously functioning art project on the playa. Uh huh. Sure. Like, certainly the largest, just geographically, because we cover a good portion of the city. No denying that. How many teams are there? The morning crew, they're a small crew. There's only like 25 people on the morning crew. They go out every morning and they grab all the lanterns in the city and they bring them back and they just drop them off the begin- at the front of our Lamplighter Chapel workspace. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is a sea of metal and glass. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's just you, you see these huge piles of lanterns all lined up. 
And then in the evening, we have to prep them. So that means going through every lantern, make sure that the glass part of the lantern is clean. Because these are old-timey, antique glass and oil lanterns that fill up with some sort of creosote or... Kerosene soot. If the wick is not raised to the proper height, if it's too high, the lantern will smoke as it burns all night long. And so it'll, it'll fill the globe up with dirty smoke. If the lantern wick is turned too low, either you just won't be able to see the light coming out of it because it just will be very dim, or it'll just get blown out by the wind. So there's mm-hmm. kind of a perfect sweet spot for having the wick turned up as high as you can get it without it smoking. So we have to go through all of them. We have to clean the globes of the dirty ones. We also have to refuel them and light them. And so that's a process that takes an hour to go through all the lanterns. It's 800 lanterns. Next week on How Lanterns Work. (laughs) We actually experimented with a few different kinds of lanterns. It used to be in lamplighters. We have a container full of lanterns. Uh Uh-huh. And we used to have, like, a few boxes of the random things people had tried, like the different kinds of lanterns people had had brought out to try. Um, Because Dietz, as you can imagine, this is the Dietz number 20. There is a a Dietz number 80. Dietz made a lot of different lanterns Uh over the years. And we and there's a couple companies that make a knockoff Dietz lantern. Dietz. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Dritz. <laughs> Those lanterns produce a brighter, nicer flame uh-huh. if they're perfectly clean and have not been dropped. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, a few cases of those, but we also have like all these random lantern sizes from all the different years. And it's just like, this is clearly the best choice. Mm-hmm. It's really a shame that you don't have your misused lantern museum in the lamplighter bar. I would look at that for minutes before moving on to the next shiny thing. (laughs) Every year we take some of the older lanterns that we don't use anymore and we put them in the temple before the temple burns. Oh, that's pretty cool. And then we fish them out of the temple from the ashes and you have this melted lantern with this globe glass that is melted over the top of the lantern. Oh, that's really cool. um, And they're cool. And we we try to give them to volunteers that have done a really good job that year. Sometimes someone's had a loss and they have some particular thing like the temple's special to them. So we'll... We'll like give them the lantern to place in the temple, and then we'll try and retrieve it afterwards, and give them like that as like something to keep. So that's what we do with our old lanterns. That's kind of amazing. I, I love that you guys have these internal rituals. Yeah, it's one of my favorite. Like taking people out on Sunday morning out to the temple to place the lanterns, then getting somebody to dress up in an approach suit and pull them out of the fire while <laughs> the coals are so hot that the hippies <laughs> haven't stolen them yet. <laughs> I would like to see pictures of that. I'm sure somebody took pictures. Yeah, you guys are pretty photogenic. Yeah, we try. (laughs) (laughs) The matching outfits helps. The matching outfits, one of the things that sort of came and went away and came back was when we're going down the main procession from center camp to the man, there's, if you imagine there's two spires, one on each side of the road, and each spire has four places to hang a lantern. So we actually try to light in unison all four spire points. So eight people walk up to the spire together and like lift the lanterns and hang them uh, for each spire as we go down that route. Like we actually put a little bit of stagecraft into our into our ritual. Like we really want it to look like this assembled procession, which is a challenge because half the people who are doing it on any given night are volunteers and it's their first time. And they're drunk. And some of them are drunk or high on other substances. And so uh, it's a little bit of a challenge, but we normally, we normally get it by the third or fourth spire. Like the first <laughs> one's like, people are like, what am I supposed to do? And like the third or fourth one on the way to the man, we're like all nicely in unison. Um, we and then a, the fifth one, people start getting sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. By the eighth, they're overconfident. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's three parts of lamplighting. There's, there's the carriers that just their job is basically to walk like without falling over to wherever we're going. <laughs> and uh, the carry pole is like, it's uncomfortable a little bit to carry. It's a yoke, you know, some 30, 40 pounds of stuff on it. The lifters are the ones that lift the lamps up into the air. We have people that aren't strong enough to do either. We make them support crew. So they'll just like some of the lanterns will go out. So they have to relight them before we lift them up. Carriers can't like put their even camel back tube in their mouth because their hands are full and everything. So support helps out with that stuff. And then you have a luminary. It's actually like an experienced lamplighter who's trying to choreograph the procession that they're doing. So they're kind of walking out and making stuff look good by the third or fourth spire. Maybe not at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, like get the get the flow going of lamplighting before it looks good. And if somebody would like to get involved with the lamplighters, how do you recommend they do so? Should they contact you guys online ahead of time or do they just show up at the event and beg you to give them some sort of scrub brush to clean the inside of these lenses? Well, 
I would say a couple things. One, we're uh, a great first camp for people to be at their first year at Burning Man because we have a lot of infrastructure. We have a pretty well-run camp with a kitchen. Like Some of the stuff we do actually makes it a lot easier for your first burn. So you allow virgins yeah, to volunteer Yeah, we allow virgins to volunteer with us. That's um, great. And there's people in, in Rangers and in DPW and in Greeters and all over the city that started out you know, camping with lamplighters and they kind of you know, found a camp that, that really fit them, but there we were their entry point to Burning Man. Um, so we totally, you can go to the, the sign up to volunteer at Burning Man page on burningman.org and become a lamplighter pre-event. Or during the event, literally five o'clock every night of the event, we take volunteers four o'clock on burn night. It takes three hours. We get people back. Like burn night, we start an, start an hour earlier to so make sure everyone does have time to like go back to camp and get ready for the burn. And um, got to look good before you go out. I believe, you know, and I don't know, the old timers would like put on their best costume on burn night. I feel like you should wear your best costume on burn night. So like, you know, I if have... I haven't already, you know, like spilled pudding on it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but when it's three in the morning and I realize I haven't eaten for like 18 hours and I'm trying to rip open a can of beans. Like, yeah, some of the clothes I wear get unmanageably awfully dirty my burning man outfits are like my babies They're, there's there's not a best one i have a red tuxedo oh that, uh, well Ooh. that uh i had you know made for me when i was at a i was in thailand you know the three-day suit shops i was like i want a red tuxedo the guy's like what I'm like yep <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> i actually was thinking that i if i ever go back i want to i want to get like a tuxedo in every color of the rainbow so that i can have a different colored tuxedo to wear each night of the event w- would you wear them in in roji biv order i might get the rainbow in order because i want to do red on makes sense on the last night i mean i guess red is at one end of the spectrum or the other the, the, the short it's true. It's a long wave. The infrared. It's arbitrary <laughs> to, to uh, order the, the way we did. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good. <laughs> if you're a light physicist, please contact us at accuracythird at gmail.com. Hashtag accuracythird. Hashtag idiots. <laughs> So I work all day working on a computer, and I go to Burning Man, and I build stuff with my hands, and I do stuff with my hands, and it's creative, and it's just completely different from my normal day life. I really like the temple. I don't know, that space like has a real meaning to me. Yeah, that's the only art project that is guaranteed to hit you every year. Yeah, right? This year, I don't know what it was. I was in a headspace, but I, I only spent like 10 minutes out there. I helped build it, and then I spent 10 <laughs> minutes out there because... I like started reading the walls and I'm like, I, I just can't, I'm out. I'm going to go like sit somewhere in deep playa and contemplate life for a minute because I just couldn't deal with being in the temple this year. One of the times I was out there this year, there was a couple getting married. Yeah. I thought that was kind of weird. No, I feel like the temple is a place for all that. There are many of us who don't really interact with temples or ritualized spaces like that outside of going to the event. For some of us, it's our pilgrimage to this spiritual, more open side of ourselves, I think. I'd, I don't know if that's yeah, true for, for that. some of our friends. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's great when people get married at the temple. I, I mean, I get that a lot of people use the temple as a space to remember people that couldn't make it to Burning Man for one reason or another. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a, it's a really spiritual place. And so if you want to say your marriage vows in front of the temple, power to you. Yeah, far be it for me to criticize anybody's take on Burning Man and marriage and life. It just struck me as odd in the moment because like here's all this death in front of me and then there's a couple getting married. It was a weird juxtaposition. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I see where you're coming from. The Lamplighter Chapel uh-huh. where we prep the lamps every night. We, I think, provide this nightly ritual to the event. It's a little quieter, a little more somber, mm-hmm. but it's not the temple. It's not. We're not talking about death. We're bringing light to the playa, right? But we have had a number of weddings actually in the lamplighter workspace because for lamplighters, it's kind of our ritual, our sacred space. Oh, and it's a beautiful space too. I, I, I love its presence on the ring road. Thanks. Yeah, I, I like it too. There are so few places on the playa that are, or at least in the, the city, that have that much open space. Yeah, because we need a lot of space to prep the lanterns and they're on fire, so we can't have a lot of clutter. Uh-huh. So That's there... a real good excuse for really premium placement. <laughs> <laughs>
we just we provide a public service, and I think just like Recycle Camp, which is always next door to us, or Artica, or, or any one of the other community service camps, like mm-hmm. we kind of need that space. They made the Esplanade farther away from the man this year. Uh huh. So we walk from Center Camp to the Temple. We walk from Center Camp to two o'clock and ten o'clock along the Esplanade. It's like five and a half miles. It's it's a good long walk, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we've we've thought about maybe putting an outpost at the three o'clock and nine o'clock keyholes mm-hmm. and having some people start there and light that part of the city. When we go out, I don't know if you ever witnessed this, but the procession passes the cauldron, that fire sculpture that's in front of first camp that is always burning 24 mm-hmm. seven. And that, that lights the, the man eventually. And, and we, yeah, we take the light from there to the man. You know, we do that. Oh, I've been going a long time. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> not D-Day. D-Day is dumb as shit. Apparently <laughs> this is all new to me. There is a cauldron that's always burning. Yeah. Is it just that big burn barrel? Like it's not that pretty. It's like wrought iron. It's pretty, pretty carefully. God damn it. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen it. And I'm pretty sure it's initially lit with a lens. So Crimson lights it at the beginning of the event every year on mm-hmm. Monday afternoon using a uh, like a Fresnel lens to focus the light of the sun to light the cauldron. And then it's kept burning the whole event. And then on Saturday, the lamplighters take the fire from the cauldron and we light like a torch. Actually, this huge, beautiful wrought iron lantern is like an eight feet tall and weighs 500 pounds. We take the light from the cauldron and we light the lantern, which is called the Lumaferos, and we carry the Lumaferos out to the man. And then we light the fire pots that the fire dancers at the base of the man use to light whatever they're spinning fire with, all that's lit from the cauldron and center camp. It's like an honor. We feel pretty yeah, honored about absolutely. it. Absolutely. I love the detail of the ritual and how it is so intricate. That's, I think, one of the things that brings me back is is that ritual, that sort mm-hmm. of nightly, somber. You know, it's a, it's just a celebration, but... We do it in kind of a quiet way. We have an invocation we do every night, though. One of the lamplighters, actually, as we get all the lamplighters together, so we've got these 800 lanterns that are hanging on carry poles that are being carried by 40 or 50 volunteers, and one of our lamplighters will grab a staff and stand there and and actually give this little speech we give every night about the three gifts that we bring to Burning Man, illumination, navigation, and celebration. Can you give us the speech? Can you inspire us with this speech right now? Have you ever given this speech? I have given the speech. You walk up to the cauldron and you say, Citizens of Black Rock City, these are your lamplighters. Each night of the event, we bring you three gifts. Illumination, Illumination, navigation, navigation, and celebration! celebration. They say, you know, lamplighters, light the city! Lamplighters, light the city! And they sort of charge off and go light the city. I I love the continuous nature of the Lamplighter Project. It's a a feature of the city which which just holds. I think um, one thing that's really changed over the years is in 2003, there was much less LED lights on the playa. Oh, yeah. I remember bringing a case of glow sticks with me to Burning Man so that I just, like, have something to crack and throw on my backpack so I wouldn't get run over by art cars, which didn't go five miles an hour back in 2003. (laughs) Whereas now, unless you're really looking for them, they have a very specific color. You can pick them out if you look across the playa, Mm -hmm. but it's not like they stand out the way they used to. I said we started in 91, but we actually really take a lot of pride in the fact that we have never not lit the city during the event. So no matter what has happened during the event, we have always gone out and lit lamps. We've lit lamps in just full-on whiteout dust storms. We've lit lamps when it was raining. We've lit lamps. The, the, the hardest challenge we ever had in lighting lamps was 2014. It rained like all day on Monday of the event, mm-hmm. I think. And the problem was that Sunday night we had lit the whole city, so all the lanterns were out there. But we couldn't use our truck to go get them because it had been raining basically since like I woke up that morning to thunder crack. It I started think raining. that one woke us all up. Yeah, that was like <laughs> that was loud. So like 5:30 in the morning or six o'clock in the morning, we all woke up to the thunder, and it didn't stop raining until three o'clock in the afternoon. Staff wasn't allowed to drive. Nobody was allowed to drive, so we had to light the city without having collected the lanterns first. So we actually took the lamplighter truck, which is a big old 1960s flatbed truck, and we put the caro tanks, instead of keeping them on the ground in the in the lamplighter workspace like we normally do, we put the caro tanks on the back of the truck. We put a table on the back of the truck, and we very slowly 
drove our truck around the whole city, taking the lanterns down, handing them to the people on the truck. They would have a little pipeline going. We had like an extra few lanterns for a buffer. And they, uh-huh. they had a little table going and they would they would prep the table as we drove, refueling the lanterns, relighting them, and then handing them back to us so we could put them back up. <laughs> so we're like doing like a moving lantern prep through the whole city. But we lit the whole city that night. Normally we wear the robes, but we actually were worried about the sloshing caro. So we wore, so we have these robes that we have, special set of robes that are just for Kidsville that are like super small. So you just had them up on so top. So we, we, we wore the Kidsville robes. <laughs> as t-shirts. As like basically <laughs> t-shirts they go down to like your knee instead oh, of your ankle great. right so we were wearing the kidsville robes and we we lit the city walking around man i was i was exhausted because we we basically walked like the full cross you know from uh-huh. man to temple and three to nine and then the esplanade and then back to camp but yeah that's a hike it was a lot of walking but you have to do it to keep cthulhu from coming in and crushing <laughs> the event i mean <laughs> It, it is a part of the ritual. You're, it's really important. You're not supposed to reveal. We the have some shit of the to ritual. Seal. You know what? Maybe people would respect the event more if they knew how important it was to keeping this reality from falling into cosmic chaos. <laughs> Accuracy Third is produced by Accuracy Third. Our theme music is by Damien and Jim. You can find out about the musicians and bands we feature on our podcast on the podcast music page of AccuracyThird.com. Accuracy Third is distributed under the Creative Commons license. You can, and you really ought to, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, on Google Play, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get podcasts. You can rate us, and please do, as well as review us on iTunes and elsewhere. If you do so, it will help your fellow burners find our podcast. We need you to tell us your Burning Man stories, too. So look us up on Facebook or give us a shout out on Twitter or just send us an old timey email and tell us your story because we really want to hear it. You can reach us by email at accuracythird at gmail.com. That's spelled out A-C-C-U-R-A-C-Y-T-H-I-R-D at gmail.com. 